Hello, everybody, and welcome. Um, can I ask you, unless you are presenting or have been asked to, um, invited to comment or are so desperate because we've ignored you that you absolutely have to say something, um, please put yourselves onto mute. Uh, the idea is to be interactive. Uh, equally, we will get interference if everybody starts trying to talk at the same time. Um, so today's webinar, Welcome, um, co-hosted by Snowden Morris of South Africa and Carl and Cameron's of um, England, London, um, is about immigration. Emigration if you're in South Africa, immigration if you're in the United Kingdom. What we want to talk about is the idea of people joining this lovely country um, and why you might want to. There will be two aspects to it. One of them will be for study, um, and that will take up a significant amount of it, but we will also tackle um, some of the opportunities for business. Um, so a little bit of background. Carter Lemon Cameron's has a long history of being very committed to South Africa and to our South African clientele. Um, our uh, former senior partner, um, still currently our head of litigation, qualified as an attorney at Weber Ventil in 1972. Um, he travelled to the UK not that long afterwards and has been an English solicitor for many decades but still travels back to South Africa um, very often twice a year to keep in contact with his network of attorneys, accountants and businesses, um, which have regular or occasional need for English law advice. Uh, the relationship has strengthened and de deepened recently. Uh, Yamila, who is going to do a lot of the presentation today, uh, was in South Africa last September to meet clients who had similar needs. Uh, she is an immigration specialist um, and was talking about the very things which she will take you through today. Um, Snowden Morris, well-known um, firm in South Africa. Jason Morris will be talking to us significantly about his experience of helping clients who are looking at relocating to the UK. Um, and he will also be working with, and you will hear from Nicole Morris, um, who is not only the office manager at Snowden Morris, but also a certified IELTS um, teacher. And she will tell you more about that and where it fits into what we're talking about. Uh, my personal knowledge is as an English solicitor, and therefore I know plenty about the law, but funnily enough, not much about immigration. So I'm looking forward to learning. My knowledge on education is quite a bit uh, better than my knowledge on immigration. Uh, partly because I have a sister who's a university lecturer, another sister whose husband is a recently retired university lecturer, one of them in English, the other one in IT and computing, uh, and my wife is a secondary school teacher. So um, education runs through my veins. Um, what I hope we can do for you is to take you through um, this, and if you are interested in our experience more widely, not only just in South African law or uh, English law, do please ask because both CLC and Snowden Morris are members of Pragma International, uh, through which we managed to get global reach uh, to trusted partners. Um, so I think we'll move on to our first slide and actually get going. Um, I've been given this slide, um, so warning you get me for another minute or two. Uh, why study in the UK? Well, first of all, quality of education. Uh, one of the very few things that the United Kingdom can still boast about doing incredibly well is education. Uh, for the size of our country, we have regularly far more uh, universities in the top 50 in the world than you would expect. Um, we have far more very highly rated public schools uh, who even have uh, non-UK um, locations now where they're promoting their particular style of educating. Um, so you have an incredible quality of education available here in the UK. You have innovative teaching methods and you also have a wide range of teaching methods. So we have um, some very, very traditional universities, some very modern universities. Uh, we have practical courses. Um, one of my clients is the British Academy of Jewellery. And as you can imagine, uh, that is most definitely an innovative um, education establishment. Um, world ranking institutions I started with um, because as far as I'm concerned coming with quality um, is that recognition. Um, 
and also, as you'll hear shortly, post-study opportunities. So one of the ways in which you might think that it would be interesting to spend um, several years or a lifetime working in the UK would be first to do an educational course here. Um, we will be thinking about postgraduate, undergraduate, um, and indeed secondary uh, education as we go through this. Um, I mentioned our former senior partner and head of litigation. I was at a very good dinner with him years and years ago where he was the introductory speaker and then passed on to a former president of South Africa. Um, and he made the joke, which I still enjoy, that people had come to this venue to hear some very good talking, but none of it was due to be from him and therefore he should shut up and hand on, which I will now do. Um, and I believe you are going to hear from Jason next. Hi, thanks, Rufus. So, yeah, as Rufus said in the introduction, we, we're we going to cover a few aspects tonight. And uh, obviously, we're going to start now with education. We'll then move on to what services we offer for businesses and then what we offer to the individual wanting to either go get educated, immigrate, or invest in the UK. So I think let's just start it off now with a slide, and I'll take two or three minutes with it so that we've got a Q&A session afterwards. If you look at the UK as a comparable market for studies around the world outside of the Republic of South Africa, the UK's average cost per student is lower than that of its American and Australian counterparts. And I would actually hazard to say it's a little bit lower than some of the English-speaking European universities. As you can see, the average cost of an undergraduate tuition, uh, undergraduate tuition in the UK is £2,200 per annum, which, yes, if you, if you simulate that to the cost of local South African education, it is somewhat higher. The difference being is you have a world leading undergraduate degree when you, you're, you're, you are finished or your children are finished. And university entrance into the UK is not done on a limited basis as it is no, no, no nothing to hide about that in South Africa, we currently have a limited accessibility to university. There's limited slots in all courses um, throughout the throughout the country. Um, you take our top universities of WITS, UJ, Pretoria, um, UCT, Stellenbosch, they all have very limited spaces. You don't really have that problem in the UK and they cater very well for overseas students. Your, post, your postgraduate tuition at being 17,100 and nine pounds per year also comes in very competitively if you look at what postgraduate actually costs here and i'm talking up to doctorate level the uk is becoming very competitive where you have a slight imbalance <laughs> is the living costs are naturally higher because you you're working in rand in pounds so when you're looking at 1300 to 1400 pounds per month outside of the borough of London, um, sorry, in the borough of London and 900 to 1300 in the rest of the UK, you need to equate that to what is it costing you to educate your children or yourself uh, in living costs in South, in South Africa. And if one takes a meridian there of 900 pounds a month, it's actually not that expensive because let's inflate it up to a thousand, sorry, not nine, a thousand, you're looking at an exchange rate of 25 to 1 at 25,000 rand a month. Bearing in mind you don't have the ancillary costs of medical aid because you've paid your immigration health surcharge, which gives you full access to the NHS. So you actually are even better off on your living costs. So where you lose on the swings, you make up on the roundabouts. So in a nutshell, the cost of studying in the UK is becoming more and more attractive to South Africans. Um, and I think I'm now going to leave you in the capital hands of your Miller to discuss more about the immigration health surcharge and the visas. Your Miller, are you there? I'm here, and um, I'll just carry on. Thank you, Jason. Um, as Jason pointed out, the cost of studies in the UK, um, when looking at numbers that are on government websites or 
um, online can be quite intimidating, but um, in overall picture, um, and in comparison and balancing with the quality um, of studies in the UK and quality of ed education, as Rufus um, explained and listed, um, it is still um, really attractive to all overseas students and families um, with children. Um, the um, current immigration health surcharge that student pay uh, is lower than any other visa um, applicants. Um, students pay £776 per each year and um, with some two years program it will be 1552 and um, as Jason um, summarized the immigration health surcharge allows full access to um, NHS in the UK non-students um, for example skilled worker visas or even graduates will pay 1035 pounds per year um, again with completely full um, access to um, NHS. Um, immigration application charges for students are significantly lower than any other immigration applications and um, currently the immigration application costs £450. Um, so the UK is really committed to attract um, students from overseas um, and everywhere else. Um, Jason? Sorry, yeah, if I could just jump in there, Yomila. If if you look at the £1,035 per annum, that equates to 25,875 rands per annum at 25 rand to the pound, which is which is high. I think it was trading at 2430 this morning at the first national bank rate. Um, that equates to 2,156 Rand and 25 cents per month medical. Now, for an over 18 dependent, you're going to pay far more on any decent medical aid in South Africa. So it's, it is something really to be considered. Definitely. Um, so we all know that um, on, on, on the screen you have the categories, uh, tier four general student, tier four child student, of course, child student is anyone um, under the age of 18. Um, today we will concentrate and we will mention um, we will be really talking about the general students, um, so mature students or um, children over 18. Um, and um, we also um, just like to point out, I'm not sure whether we've got anyone from EU or um, someone whose family members are interested to come from any other EU countries. There are special arrangements for students coming from EU and it is the EU nationals or citizens who are not in possession of pre-settled or settled status under the European Settlement Scheme. So anyone who's never been to the UK and would like to come to um, study in the UK comes under the general immigration rules now. And um, But still, um, there are differential um, agreements and special arrangements for students coming from European Union. Um, Jason now uh, will move on to... Um, to start the um, talk about um, licensed student sponsors, because anyone coming to UK needs to obviously find a place on the course and um, the course provider must be registered with the home office. Yeah, th thanks, Yomila. Yes, so to, to say you want to go to study in the UK, you can't necessarily come and say, uh, I'm in, in, enrolling for a course at XYZ. The, the institution has to be a recognized higher education institution that can award degrees or diplomas. Um, I'll give you an example, and I, I'd like to actually welcome, we've got some good friends who we, we, we do a lot of work with as both, both firms and um, especially us down here in South Africa with HRUC, which is the Harrow Richmond Uxbridge Colleges, um, who are on the line. And I'm sure Ashvin and Mark would be able to answer some questions later if we need to. But the education institution must be registered. Now, the, that is obviously for, for, for post-senior certificate. You can have, the, and there is a lot of movement at the moment for South African students to do 
secondary school, in other words, high school in the UK. But again, those high schools, those boarding schools that they would go to, need to be registered with the Home Office as recognized learning institutions that will, and in the case of higher learning, it's got to be a recognized higher learning institution. In other words, post-secondary school, post-senior certificate in, in level here. So it can't be one of your fly-by-nights, for want of a better term. I'll give you a, in a South African extent, example. I think everybody knows Educor has recently been deregistered. The Damlin Colleges have been deregistered by the, the, the Department of Education. It's got to be somebody registered there, and, and that is your caveat. Um, the Home Office introduced licensing really to delegate the powers um, to institutions um, and, and to allow them to have the direct relationship with students. And um, this also, um, the delegation also allows um, the institutions to uh, fulfill the sponsorship duties effectively. So the Home Office will carry out checks when the institution is applying for sponsor license. And then effectively, if everything's running smoothly, the um, schools and colleges are um, left to uh, to monitor the intake of students and to ensure that um, all students that are coming from overseas um, fulfill um, their obligations as well. Um, it, I would say that any any college that is interested to become a student sponsor can do so, um, but the Home Office will have um, different requirements for different um, corporate structures or different structures um, for the colleges. So we have represented, oh, as Rufus mentioned, um, British Academy of Jewellery. Um, it is a unique, really quite unique um educational institution and uh, with a uh, huge interest um, from overseas. Um, and we also um, represented in the past and still are publicly funded colleges. Um, and it is actually a preference generally from the Home Office um, to have publicly funded colleges and, and universities to um, become sponsors. Um, various research institutes and school maintained by local authorities um, also are um, registered sponsors now. And um, the requirements, as I said, will vary. Um, we will later go through general requirements as to what is needed to become a sponsor. But um, I don't think we have space to, to mention different requirements for each um, different corporate structure of the school. Jason, I'll let you to um, get um, on to what type of courses uh, overseas students can join. Sure. So the overseas, overseas students need to enter into courses that are have the, an RQ, RQF level three, four or five, basically as a minimum and as a full-time course leading to a qualification below the a degree and it's got to be 15 hours a minimum week organized daytime study. Now, what is RQF? RQF is very similar to the UK equivalent to our NQF levels. So there you have the RQF 3, 4, 5. That is your diploma, your diploma courses. Um, then you got your full-time courses, which is RQF 6, 7, and 8, uh, which is degree level or above. Obviously, there's different RQF levels depending on the type of the course. So if it's undergraduate, postgraduate, and uh, then also there's programs for specialists such as doctors and dentists. So really the course, it's got to be something that is is recognized and gives you that RQF level. So if you're looking for a course, and obviously we would naturally say go to one of the, the, the preferred, the preferred pro, uh, suppliers, but if you're looking for a course, you've got to make sure that it's minimum RQF Three, which is the equivalent of our NQF level four, I would say. Um, so that, that that's where you are on there. Um, I think the next thing we need to now discuss is the, the knowledge of the English language, because even though South Africa is primarily an English-speaking country, um, you do need to, especially 
uh, undergraduates, there is certain English language requirements, and I'm going to hand over to Nicole now to explain a bit more to us about those requirements and, and ALTS and the way it works. Uh, so, yes, you need to have a standard English, which the test that they use is called IELTS. It's the International English Language Testing System. It's trusted by governments, employers, and thousands of uh, learning institutions across the world. Majority of visa forms for extended stay or right to remain for the United Kingdom require the IELTS to be taken. Um, there's a four-part test. You need to be able to speak, read, write, and listen. All four parts are required for just about all types of visas. Some visas have different requirements, but if all parts are required, you need to pass all four parts on the relevant band score, um, depending on what you're applying for. So there's two types of IELTS you could write. There's a general IELTS test and an academic IELTS test. The academic test is required mainly for those working visas, um, as opposed to the general one, which is for the study visas or most other visas, actually, that you need to get into the UK. Um, the layouts of the test are the same for both general and academic, only with the academic obviously being of a higher level because you're obviously going into a working position as opposed to just a studying position. So you're looking at multiple choice questions, written questions. Some questions in the academic are uh, matching the columns, uh, um, graphs, things like that, where you've got to actually show more of your English as opposed to just basic English for the, the general test. Um, there are two different ways to do your IELTS test. You can do one on paper, which is basically writing your answers in pencil on paper, and they collect your tests when the tests are finished. Or you can do the computer based, where you physically go into an institution and you work on their computers for the uh, uh, times allotted. The time is the same for both tests. The content is the same for both types of tests. The only difference being the processing time for your results. So if you need to get your results quite quickly, you would do the computer test because it takes three to five days after writing to get your results, where the written one is about 14 days. Also, if you have bad handwriting, unfortunately, do not opt for the written one because you will not be able to get the marks you're looking for, unfortunately. Um, I have actually taken a general test not so long ago in, in writing. So, yeah, it is quite a lot of... Uh, preparation is required and handwriting is very important because the one section is written, there are two parts to it, and it's an hour of handwriting, total writing only. Multiple choice is obviously easier because you just mark a circle. There is no negative marking and you can't actually fail, but there are minimum band requirements, which I'll talk about later on, um, as to what you require for each one. Um, the few... People that are not required to take out, so basically if you've got the qualifications already on the slider here, um, but I am registered uh, IELTS teacher with the British Council. I did the course last year, and I'm happy to help anybody who requires preparation for learning for the IELTS test and obviously booking the test as well. Yeah, thanks, thanks Nicole. Jess. I will just add that um, the university or co uh, course provider will check these qualifications before um, they issue the um certificate of acceptance on studies letter for the student and it is the, their responsibility to ensure that the students um, they are accepting has the correct qualification the home office will check that as well when at the time when the student submits his own application so it needs check on 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 a couple of um occasions before the student actually um submits their application now we will move on to um just, call... just before yep. you do um that the risk of being flippant nicole am i right in yep. guessing that in all probability there are quite a few of my colleagues and or friends who could find that if they sat an ielts test they'd fail it in the same way that um the poor people who are dragged through our citizenship tests are expected to know how many scottish um, members of parliament there are and when Wales and England became a single unified jurisdiction, neither of which I have any idea of. Yeah, so that's very possible, um, specifically with the academic one. So if you're trying to apply for a job, because it's a much harder test to write, English speaking, born and bred people struggle to get the relevant band levels that are required. Obviously, each uh, exam, academic or general, have band levels, depending on what you're applying for. 
And if you, you they go by 0.5s, so you could get a six and a half when you actually need a seven and you will not pass, you have to rewrite it again. So it does require a lot of preparation, going through the skills that are required. It's not just a general, I'm writing an English test, I spoke in English my whole life. Yeah. Most people that do that don't seem to actually get through. Oh, the you, no, similarly, um, my yeah, my yeah. poor wife is sometimes given a right. Um, right. native speaker um, to yeah. put through um, right now. GCSE or A level, and mm. what you find there is again that um, it's quite possible um, to find that um, that person can speak very very competently, but when yeah. it comes to writing. Right. Um, Wade, sorry, can you mute yourself, please? We're getting feedback from you. Um, that you you find that they really struggle to do the things which please the examiners. Um, are you, again, given that I've broken in and um, um, pushed, we've got two questions which are worth picking up on if we can. Um, the costs for the IELTS tests and also whether the tests are necessary for an ancestry visa. So should we, we take both of those? Do you want to questions now or at the end? Yeah, let, 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 let's let's grab that one because we're on English right now. Perfect. Um, the cost would depend on which test you're writing and which country you're writing it from. Most of the time you cannot write the basic IELTS test from within the UK if you're applying to work or study in the UK. The uh, second level you can do only in the UK once you've done the first level. It's only valid for two years. So... Um, you'd apply, uh, it's nearly about 5,000 Rand from South Africa, depending on which one you're writing. Um, so if you were looking for a study one, you would apl uh, apply to do the basic level now. And then in two years time, when it's about to expire, you would go and then if you're still in the UK and want to carry on, you'd have to do the next level, which you can only apply for in the UK. And obviously there's another cost involved in that. And yes, every time you fail, you've got to pay again to write the test again. So it does pay to have the preparation in advance to not necessarily fail, but don't get the, the band score that you acquire. Um, ancestry visas, yes, it depends on which part. If you are the ans the actual ancestry line or if you're doing the spousal of the ancestry, um, but your Miller and Jason will tell you more on those ones for what's required. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the ancestry visa uh, do not require English language, um, the, um, um, proof of English language knowledge. Um, so it is one of the easier routes to the UK if you are eligible. Okay, um, we will move on to um, course fees. Uh, we will later, um, very very soon, discuss um, who the the financial requirements are for students who come into the UK, um, but they are different from course fees. So even the, where there is an exemption in some um, cases for finance to meet the financial requirement, course fees must be paid um, for for every with every student. Jason. Hi. Yes. Thanks, Yomila. So yes, the the the, the course fees. There is a minimum threshold, um, and you need to you need to be able to show that uh, you can afford the first year. But the academic year is worked on nine months, and generally those have to be paid up front before the institution will issue you a cash letter, which uh, you will get onto uh, shortly. The amount will be on the cash letter as to what is required. Now, you then need to, obviously, as we've discussed before, show that you can afford your, your subsistence. So for, the, for that nine months, in, in London, it's £1,334 per month. Outside of London, it's £1,023 per month. Um, obviously, if, if it's a boarding school, um, and the registered independent school, the boarding fees would need to be paid and you would need to be able to show that uh, whatever other requirements are on the cash letter need to be paid. Um, so if, if we just work work it out again, the and, and, and as I said before, it, it, it works out to subsistence of about 23,000 230,175 rand a year, which divide by 12 doesn't give you that much that high. It's just under 20,000 rand a month 
subsistence that is required for those students, which may seem high for students, but it's their full board and lodging. Remember, they're not living at home anymore. They're uh, living where they, you know, in a foreign country, and and that's basically the minimum that they will require. Um, so, it, um, it, would, it is. Sorry, Yomila. Yeah, yeah. I would just, I would just add that with accommodation, if, not talking about boarding. Um, but if you do pay any accommodation, you can you can show that to the college when before they assign pass letter. It will be set off against the um, maintenance requirement. Um, so um, if you're required to to um, live in a student accommodation or even private, and you do pay any this deposit before you apply for visa, um, you are able to reduce the maintenance. Um, with the level of maintenance you are required to show. Um, so that's that's quite um and also boarding, I'm not sure I missed it. It's just that it's again you need to show if you're coming to study for two or three year course and you've got boarding with um the course um at the beginning when you're applying, it's sufficient to show that you've got sufficient funds for one year of um boarding fees. Now, we, we were talking about the course fees, um, and I'm going to talk about financial requirement, which is different from course fees. So in addition to having your uh, first year of course fees, as well as boarding or accommodation paid, um, applicants or students are required to show that they meet financial requirement, which Jason has discussed. Um, there are exemptions. So if um, the student um, was um, has been in the UK for 12 months, let's say, I don't know, as a dependent of a skilled worker and then the skilled worker left and now they want to switch to student visa, they do not need to show that they meet the financial requirement. Um, and the same goes for dependent of um, or children that were under 18. Now they are over 18, parents leaving UK, but they want to switch to tier four student um, category, then they are not required to show the same level of the financial requirement um, level. And um, also um, differential evidence requirement um, is worth mentioning. There is a list of countries um, um, where um, from, from which students are not required to um, show that they meet financial requirement. It's not obviously European countries um, unfortunately, um, there are not many um, African countries, but um, yeah, the list is long, so I'm not going to go, but if you are interested, um, just drop me an email if you want to know whether a particular country is um, exempt, then I'll be happy to um, either forward the list or just um, tell you whether, whether your uh, country is exempt. Um, I would also like to um, just sort of um, outline the inside and outside of London. So the, um, there are 32 London boroughs that are listed um, within the Greater London um, area. And I think, Jason, we mentioned yesterday a um, situation where the school um, is, a, is a school boarding and um, the, the accommodation is outside the London area, but the, the course and the school is um, within. So in the London, these, unfortunately, will apply. Um, and again, we've got a list of um, London boroughs and, you know, on how far it's um, the inner London actually um, is, because it is quite a difference if you have to show for it is £300 difference per month and you need to show um, evidence for up to nine months. So it's quite quite a difference. And we find that um, students then it, it does affect the the um, choice um, of of the um, institution. And just very quickly on financial requirement as well, um, third party support is generally not allowed, but for students, even if they are over 18, parents support, financial support, parents bank statements uh, will be um, accepted. Um, also, um, the money needs to be held for um, at least 28 days in a row. Um, and bank statement that needs to be submitted. Um, the latest entry on the bank statement needs to be 31 days 
prior to the date of the application. So it's just before the application. So it's not in some immigration categories, applicant needs to show that they've held money for six months, three months. So with student, it is 28 days in a row and the balance must not fall below even even one penny. <laughs> so so um, it, it is quite strict. Um, yet for student, the financial requirement or, or providing evidence for financial um, financial requirement is not as 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 um, difficult because it's just basically the one month. Now we will move on to application process, and I'll let Jason to run through this. Uh, yes, thanks. Okay, so now you've you've decided where you're going to apply. You've uh, got your, you've made your application. You've got your case. Now we need to do your, your visa application. So a student visa, like most other visas, requires documentation. The first, the first thing that you need is obviously a valid passport, a valid South African passport, that has got in, not necessarily enough time on it, but more than six months on it. And bearing in mind that it is very difficult to renew a South African passport out of our borders, we would recommend that you have enough time on your passport for the duration of a student visa or any visa that you are going to apply. So what are the documents that are required? The app, obviously, the proof of financial ability is required. The South African passport, a proof of address in South Africa. In most cases, we require a birth certificate for the applicant. And in some cases, the parents' birth certificates and um, sometimes, occasionally, the parents' marriage certificate. Now, when we talk about birth certificates, there are various types of birth certificates in South Africa. Any child born in the Republic of South Africa after 2010 automatically received what is called an unabridged birth certificate. Uh, prior to 2010, however, abridged birth certificates were issued. Those are not accepted by the Home Office. We need to get the full unabridged birth certificate. So in other words, the birth certificate that shows the, the baby's, the child's name, the applicant's name, mother and father's name, and place of birth, date of birth, etc. The visa process follows an online application. Normally that is started by us. We, we then do the application, the motivation, you guys will finish it off. Applications of fees are paid. The next process then is a biometric appointment. Currently, the UKVI biometric provider is TLS Global. Um, they are based here in Santon with offices in Durban, Cape Town, and other uh, small other satellite areas around the country. That biometric appointment is basically where your fingerprints are taken. You go there, it's a, you pay for the appointment when you get there, and they will take 10 fingerprints, a palm print, a digital photograph of you, and in some cases they scan retina as well. That's your biometric po portion. That all goes off to UKVI. You then have a time scale which varies depending on the visa category, Certain visas that are still processed by UKVI in Pretoria currently have a turnaround time of 15 working days. And bear in mind that that 15 working days excludes UK bank holidays and South African public holidays. Anything processed in the UK is running between 15 working days and up to six weeks. However, you can apply for a priority service for it, but that is an extra charge. So it is worthwhile to plan in advance because the priority service can cost upwards of one thousand um, pounds, and which at an exchange the current exchange rate is rather hefty. Um, and it's worth mentioning as well that um, we we used to have biometric cards um, that Home Office issued, which you then collected from once you entered the UK. So normally you would be entered. Um, um, you would be um, given a vignette in the passport, which would be valid for 30 days or three months. And you would enter UK and collect your biometric card um, 
which is the size of a driving license in the UK. Now, um, these are being phased out and um, there is purely electronic process and visas are now linked to passports. So um, you're not going to carry any any big net in the passport or biometric card. It's simply, I don't know, um, at the border, police checks, everything will be done electronically, scanning the passport, which and it will link to um, your status um, on gov.uk website. Um, you will be sharing this with schools, with employers. Um, so no more visa cards. <laughs> so um, I will move on to student sponsors. Um, and um, as I said, the sponsor licenses came about um, with an idea of Home Office delegating their their, their control to um, institutions and and in with students it means universities, colleges, and schools. Um, so um, application for sponsor license the form itself is not um, exceedingly um, difficult to fill. It really requires all the correct information. However, the part of the application process is the Home Office visit, and it's quite rigorous. And um, the Home Office will arrange uh, for a caseworker or two, or sometimes even three, to arrive at the premises before the license is issued. So it's called pre-licensing visit. Um, the the um, pre license visit also in, uh, is included where um, the uh, student probationary sponsor has applied for student sponsor status. So um, the school or college or university that is applying will be given probationary period. Um, if that, that goes without fail. Any, any um, institution will be um, on probationary uh, period for 12 months. It does not reflect the quality of the application or quality of um, the, um, the institutions. Um, the requir basic requirements are there on the slide. Um, and um, all documents, for example, rec recent record of a fire risk assessment conducted by a competent person, they will want to see originals. So if there is anything in electronic form, the Home Office will want to see where it came from, when it when was it sent. So they will want to see the original email, for example, um, from um, any authority that had provided um, the report. Um, when carrying the pre-licensing assessment, the Home Office will also check that the um, potential sponsors has the necessary human resources system in place. Um, record keeping for students um, and, and they don't need to be um, elaborate um, software systems on the website even if it's um, you know we, we still have sponsors that keep paper reports and records of students but they are really thorough they will want to see the breakdown of the student cohort so they will want to see the domestic UK UK based and, and students that are not these are nationals then they will want to see students um, they have on pre-settled settle status and the European Union Settlement Scheme. And the pre-licensing -lic pre visit also will want to see why is the um, potential sponsors applying for license. So a detailed business plan, but together with, with um, evidence of queries receiving from potential overseas students. So they will want to see how many, not applications, because it's not possible to um, obviously... <laughs> treat um, query as an application if you are not a sponsor, but they will want to see um, how the recruitment of overseas students um, is done. If there is an agent involved um, to um, recruit overseas students, then they will be pretty much involved in the application and um, the details will be um, disclosed to the Home Office um, as well. Okay. Thanks, Yomila. We, we, we're now going to touch on the eligibility. And now the reason we're going into this in such depth is we, we, we'd like, we often get questions of how do we know that the institution we're applying to is a decent quality institution? And as Yomila just said, with, with the trust comes responsibility. So these 
institutions that accept foreign students and can issue the CAS register letter are quality controlled by the UK government. In other words, as it says on the slide, they must be a genuine education institution and operating legally in the UK. Where does this come in? We've had a big problem in South Africa with fly-by-night colleges pop up. We know of a lot of ki of children that went to secondary schools, their senior certificates are not registered, it's not registered with Umbelusi. So this, this circumvents it. Um, they must have appropriate education standards. So their courses are vetted. The, and, and that's what gives it the global touch to it. Um, and, it, and, it, and it's vetted by an appropriate education authority in the UK who's also recognised. And it's a fit and proper establishment. So if your children or you are going over to study, you're not going to get there and find that this is basically a hole in the wall like you find in some other jurisdictions, including South Africa. We've had it. We've been involved with helping people that have been caught by these institutions. So it, it just shows that... Um, there is gravitas to the situation. And, and I think you'll see in the next slide where we go to now the management roles, uh, you'll see that the institution has to have a backbone. It has to have a, 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 a admin scenario in place. So there's an authorizing officer, a senior competent person who's responsible for the actions of the staff representatives who use, the, who use it. It's not just a fly by night. Key contact staff uh, are, become your main point of contact, um, and they are the main point of contact with UKVI. UKVI is the UK Visas and Immigration Service. Um, it is a division of the Home Office, and they handle the visas for the UK in all spheres around the world. Um, and we could get in depth as to as to how it's broken down, but it it, it is operating around the world. Um, and you need to get someone who's registered as a level one user responsible for the day-to-day -day management of, of that license. Uh, so again, these are well-established institutions that are offering you high quality education that is regulated. Um, it's not something that just falls out of the sky and people are looking for students who arrive there and get a serious shock. And that that is what they need to do to give that all important CAS letter, which I think your Miller is going to discuss a bit more with us, because that is your golden ticket. Without that, you can have all the financial backing in the world. You cannot get that student visa. So your Miller, you're still muted. Um, okay, so so we've mentioned the confirmation of acceptance or class letter a few times um, now, and it is indeed the the most important document for the student um, if they want to apply. Um, students will not get the letter as such, and but it is um, it is, um, just just a reference number. But before the sponsor can issue class letter, and also at the time when they're applying, they need to this justify how many letters do they how many students they expect to um, allocate um, in one year and allocation year runs from April to April um, so so when applying for sponsor license um, I mentioned a detailed sort of business plan is required and the home office will want to see um, the queries and the recruitment and the numbers um, how many students are interested and if you're applying for sponsor license, it must be worth it. And therefore the Home Office is ex expecting that at least up to 50% or up to 50% of the current student body will be overseas students. Um, if we've done applications where these institutions requested more, um, more than 50%, um, but they were indeed able to justify um, the number of the class letters when at the stage of the application for sponsor license were, were given. Um, so, so the business plan that I keep mentioning um, needs to provide detailed breakdown of proposed um, students and um, the Home Office will want to know countries um, that um, the um, students are applying from, where the most interest lies, and um, 
again, um, they will want to review any recruitment agents um, or other agencies um, that are overseas. Um, and these will need, be, need to be named within the application uh, for sponsor license. The class letter itself, um, the, the, what it contains is on the slide. And um, it is basically a summary of the text that the institutions, the schools, colleges carry out and the basis on which they issue a uh, place or um, offer a place for the, the student. I would mention, um, I would mention the um, minimum or maximum, actually maximum time limit of study because students are not really allowed to be here for um, indefinitely extending the um, student visas. The student visa doesn't lead to settlement. Therefore, um, students coming in, if they want to aim for indefinitely to remain on settlement or British citizenship, ultimately, uh, they will need to be extending their visa for at least 10 years and then apply based on long residence in the UK. So with skilled worker visas, um, skilled workers can apply for indefinite leave from after five, year of con five, five years of continuous residence with students. As I said, the, the visa itself doesn't lead to settlement. And for this reason, um, at some point, the Home Office issued a limit. So um, there, on the slide, there is a um, five-year maximum. That's that's a general idea. So, But if a student is coming to study below degree level, um, They'll, they will have a limit of two years and no more. It is literally not possible to extend um, visa if the studies are below degree level. Um, at the degree and above, um, the student, um, the Home Office will issue visa for a maximum of five years um, if there is such course. Um, if um, initially the student receives three years of visa, they will be at later stage able to extend it to maximum of five. However, um, areas such as architecture, law, medicine, dentistry, um, veterinary, veterinary studies, um, and some music degrees as well will be um, given exception and they will be allowed to um, extend their visa to um, further two, three years, um, obviously, um, to meet the um, qualifications. Um, the knowledge of English language, as we have mentioned before, that will be assessed at the time when the sponsor issues the or offers to issue the cast letter. And um, they will check the the um, authenticity of the test provider where the tests were held. And um, I, I think there was a question before whether uh, about the Cambridge. So there are different um, test providers. However, IELTS, uh, which are provided by or governed by um, council, British Council, are the most reliable way. Um, and um, if, if the test is done on paper, I'm not sure we've got still Nicole with us. Um, she mentioned that yep. if, if, the, if the tests are done on paper, it's supposed to do I think, the electronic proof or just the passcode from South Africa. Yeah, you can get an ETRF um, a few days after you've written the test which you can physically download yourself or send on the link to the relevant institution to get the results from. Oh, okay. Because the application forms for visas um, ask, how are you able to prove mm -hmm. um, your um, test of opinion? So we will have a drop-down menu and you will have a choice of either uploading the certificate or just provide a link. And so basically the Home Office then will um, type in the link to their search um, system and they will be able to see what test was sat and um, how yeah. how each um, applicant um, passed the test. Thank you, Nicole. Um, okay. So yeah, so the cast letter is very important. I mean, that's the that's the document for the students to apply. And as I said, um, sponsors when making the application for license will need to carefully justify the number of pass letters they will be issue they will, they will be allowed to issue in each year um jason will now talk further about sponsors duties 
So it means what the colleges and universities um, need to do. So, so when I said in the beginning that the Home Office delegated um, the checks and, and powers to um, institutions, um, so this is what they are expected to do. Yeah, so the, these students, these institutions, should I rather say, have to keep a record of what the students do. So it, it it's not a situation where student, people will come in with a cast letter and then can just be free willy. They need to actually do their courses. Because as you can see, there is a there is an onus on the institutions to keep a record of the, the students, what they're doing, their re visa refusal rate. So in other words, are they are they canvassing students who are actually not getting visas for whatever reason? Um you know, they 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 need to show the enrollment rate, a completion rate of at least 85%. So people a lot of people ask, why do they need to have a completion rate of 85%? It's simple. It shows that it's an institution that that is there, it is a serious institution. It complies with the law. It's it's keeping up its side of the bargain. You wouldn't want to go to an institution where less than 85% of the students complete their, their courses. So all that is taken into account when the Home Office approves an institution that can give give these cast letters and take in foreign students. I mean, as your Miller said, because it's very important to understand that a student visa does not give you a right to naturalization in the UK. It's only other than those very exceptional circumstances of over 10 years where other visas give you a right to eventually get indefinite leave to remain. So that that basically sums up the sponsor's duties. Um, now, I think what we're going to move on to now is, I think your middle will take us through how we actually help the, the okay. students and what Jason, they do for the students. Sorry. sorry. I, I, no, it's all right. It's just I've, I've gone rogue. And before we move off this slide, I'm going to ask Afshin if um, we could hear a view from a sponsor. Um, Ashin is at, uh, well, Ashin can tell us who he works for and yeah. uh, what's going on. Off you go. Hi. Uh, yeah, thank you for um, introducing me. So, yeah, I'm Afshin. Um, I'm the International uh, Officer for Harrow, Richmond and Uxbridge Colleges. Um, thank you, Jamila and Nicole and Jason, for a really informative um, presentation so far. Um, just from the sponsor's perspective, um, I just want to make a couple of additional points to the um, ones you've already made. Um, as a sponsor, sometimes we kind of go try and go above and beyond what the um, uh, the UKV are looking for. So um, this is not might not be standard across all institutions, but um, as a sponsoring institution, we um, have decided to interview all students. So um, we 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 have we call them credibility interviews with each student who applies to us, and we record those interviews. Um, either on Teams or Zoom, and we keep that uh, as a record so that um, uh, UKVI has access to that if, if they require it. Um, occasionally, sometimes we find that students are actually interviewed by UKVI as well as part of the visa application process. Um, not so much these days, but it used to be a bigger thing uh, kind of uh, five, six years ago where students were interviewed um, and they could be refused a visa on the basis that they did not... Um, give a credible kind of interview or did not seem credible um, to the um, to the caseworker. Um, and then in addition to that, in addition to those duties, um, we, uh, we you can face an audit as well as an institution. So I've undergone a couple of um, visit, visits from UKVI um, in the kind of past 10 years. Um, and when they when the UKVI visit, they do these checks. They they check this, the um, your attendance uh, records for each student. They look at um, the process of uh, ha the the process you went through to admit a student, what qualifications they had, checking their IELTS um, certificate. Um, they'll look at the timetable of the student. Are they studying fifteen hours a week minimum? Um, and it's quite an in depth. Um, uh, kind of audit they 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 stay with you for at least one to two days um checking through um lots of the records so um those are the only two points i wanted to make 
Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions at the end of the presentation as well if anything comes up that's relevant. Thank you. Thanks. That was really yeah. useful. Okay, so um, we already have question in in the chat about other visas than than tier four. Um, so this slide is really basically how can we help um, in terms of tier four applications. So whether it's um, sponsor license application, we we do everything from scratch. So um, I would um, I would normally come to um, your premises and and. Um, well, we will start the application process, but I know what the home office visit looks like for the pre-licensing visit. So we can go through everything that the home office really expects and um, what they will be looking for, uh, prepare you for the application, prepare you for the um, pre-licensing visit and explain um, how managing the sponsor license um, is for the uh, years go ahead. Um, for the students as well, um, we can help with the full application. We can review application before you apply. Um, so, um, and, and you know, with, with um, Nicole and Jason as well, prepare you for the English um, language test to make sure you meet all the requirements. Um, I'm an immigration solicitor here at Cartel and Cameron's and um, we handle what really wide variety of um, immigration matters. Um, the work-based applications are here um, on this slide. Um, the latest one um, introduced by the Home Office is the Global Business Mobility Route. Um, there are four or five subcategories um, of which um, the expansion worker is most popular and most used by um, overseas businesses sending out their representative to the UK. If anyone heard of previously of um, overseas represent sole representative of an overseas business, this is the expansion worker now. The advantage is as well now that the businesses can send teams um, to the UK. So it's not just the sole representative, but um, the whole team if the business requires that. Um, we have a we have a question in in our chat, um, and I'll just I think go back to it. Um, um, it, it be, is it Edie or Eddie? Um, I apologize for um, for the pronunciation. So um, Eddie is a dual qualifier, um, sorry, dual citizen, um, EU and South African, and would like to know what options do they have in terms of visas to live and work in the UK? Well, that depends on um, your previous immigration history. So as a Portuguese national, if you have never lived in the UK or, or worked previously, uh, normal visa immigration rules and normal visa work visa will apply. However, so you are qualified in, in England um, as a solicitor. So I just wonder whether you, are we able to speak to um, Edith Rufus? Um, yeah, Gary wants to come off mute. Not, we can we can connect afterwards. That's fine. Um, it so, may be better to conduct that chat later, um, so, one to one, because um, it's starting to look like advice and things where we can stray <laughs> into confidential information, which we're then trying to splat all over the um, internet. So. Um, I was just going no, to no, go through categories. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it just depends on the personal immigration history. So, as I said, if you have never, as a European national, if you have never lived in the UK, actually, uh, well, before Brexit or before um, the deadline to um, obtain status under the EU settlement scheme, then normal skill worker visa, you will need to find a sponsor, an employer who is registered as a home office. Um, um, sponsor. Sponsor. So, so um, that's, that's the one way. way. If you have lived in the UK and if you are registered under the um, EU settlement scheme as an international, then um, you, you can work, work in the, the UK um, with that permission. Rufus, sorry, can you mute yourself? Oh. Okay. Just done, I think. Okay. Well, I, th I think what we're going to, if we can just maybe just backtrack a bit, and I know we're getting on a bit, 
And I, I'd like to also just thank Wade Whitaker from uh, the British Council. I see he has joined us. Um, and uh, I, I think he'll also be very valuable to answer any questions if they come on. So thank you for joining us, Wade. Um, Yomile, if I could also just add regarding the how, how, how do we help businesses and employees, if we could maybe just go back one slide for a second. So as you can see, there's the skilled worker sponsor license, the skilled workers visas. The UK has a critical skills list that is required. Um, and if, if your, your vocation falls under that skilled workers list and you can secure employment in the UK, for a South African perspective, if you have no ancestral ties, and we're going to get on to ancestral shortly, if you get a if you apply for a skilled workers visa, and 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 bearing in mind there is the the old favourite of healthcare workers, which has become very difficult. Healthcare workers cannot take dependence anymore. But let's use a a a, a maybe a better example of a a doctor. Um, a South African qualified doctor who has 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 been registered with the relevant UK authorities. That skilled workers visa for after that five years, as your Miller explained earlier on, leads to what is known as indefinite leave to remain. In other words, you make an application for indefinite leave to remain, and then you can naturalize. That is rather important because. Naturalization gives citizenship. So after five years and you get your indefinite leave to remain, you can apply for citizenship as you can with all these other visa categories that are on here for businesses and employees. So it, it is rather important and it, it shows that the UK is open for business. Um, the UK, the Department of Business and Trade always whenever we speak to them, says we're open for business, we're looking for business. The UK wants to grow its 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 skill set. And that is what is enshrined in these visas. It's a simple to use visa category. Um, then maybe if we could move on to the next slide, we can discuss more in depth because I think this is perhaps where it'll help. The number one query we receive is UK ancestry. Now, how does UK ancestry work? It it, it works in the, have you if you have a British born grandparent. Now, up until the current British Nationality Act, that only really worked through the male line. So it was if you had on the paternal line a British born grandparent, that male primogenitor has been removed. So it's on either side, paternal or maternal line. A British-born grandparent will entitle you to apply for a UK ancestry visa. The ancestry visa allows you to live and work in the UK. It doesn't allow you public benefits, but it does allow you national health because you will pay an immigration health surcharge. And it allows you to take your dependents, i.e. your spouse and your minor children, and in certain cases, adult dependents. Adult age of majority in the UK is like South Africa, it is 18. So that is a very important category for South Africans because a lot of South Africans do have UK ancestry. It's part of our history. The other alternate, the other visa category is, now, is the spouse or unmarried partner. So where this becomes very important is where you have one spouse or one partner in a relationship who has UK ancestry or a UK citizenship, they can apply for a, 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 a spousal dependence visa and can go into the UK with their spousal. Those visas are normally issued for a three-year period and can be renewed within the UK um, and eventually leaves to international, uh, indefinite leave to remain. You then have the international sports person visa which is a specific visa given for international players, such as when the Springbok rugby players go and play in the UK. They're earning, a, they're earning money for playing there, so they get a sports person's visa. You then have the standard visitor's visa, which I don't think needs much explanation. That is 
if you're going to go visit there, those visas are issued in various uh, six months, two years, five year, and ten year segments. At the moment, it is a physical vignette that is placed in your passport. Um, unfortunately, the local representative of UKVR couldn't join us this evening due to other uh, commitments, but we were hoping to discuss about the move to e-visas. South Africa will be getting the UK e-visa rollout for tourist visas probably from mid-2025, so you will no longer get a, a traditional vignette in your passport. It will much be much like the e-visas, uh, which is just a piece of paper that you print out. You then get your dependent visas, which, are, as I've alluded to earlier, those are for your children, your underage, your children under the age of 18, or adult dependents who can no longer look after themselves. So, situation where a family moves to the UK and there are parents that are left alone in, in South Africa who cannot look after themselves in those certain circumstances you can make a motivation for a dependent visa into the UK. Um, but I do need to make it clear that that is few and far between and there needs to be exceptional circumstances. It's for a very high threshold, yeah. yeah. Um, with dependents as well, um, we, we discussed students at large and um, um, from January 2024, any new applications from that date for student visa are no longer permitted to bring dependents to the UK. So it will be basically the student on their own um, coming into the UK. There is an exception for PhD students or um, doctoral qualifications and that allow um, dependents. Sorry, Jason. No, no, no problem. So I think I've, I think I've, I think I've chewed your ear off quite enough on, on what we do there for families. Um, and I think we now... We we now move on to what the the British citizenship ex aspect. So the yeah, first so very important. Yeah. Sorry, Yomila, do you wanna do you wanna take the slide? No, go for it, yeah. and I'll add. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I think yeah, the first part is registration. Now registration actually will come up quite often with the new British Nationality Act because now you can a lot of people who before were excluded from registration as British citizens because they could only pass through the paternal line, being the father, can now claim British citizenship through the maternal line. And that is if you have a mother. And in some cases, due to the historical unfairness, a grandmother born in the UK or grandfather from the maternal line who couldn't pass nas uh, nationality on, but normally the grandmother you would then apply for registration as a British citizen. We would do the application for you. Uh, together with Carter Lim Cameron's, you would get a certificate of naturalization. You would then attend a, 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 a registration, a certificate of registration, a, regist a, natural, a ceremony at the High Commission in either Johannesburg or Pretoria, uh, where you would do the necessary, and then you would be able to apply for your passport. That again covers then the naturalization. That is more often than not, that is done within the UK. It's once you've spent your five years there and you've uh, now gotten definite leave to remain. We next then move on to the historical unfairness. And I'm going to ask you, Miller, to explain more about that in Section 4L um, of the Nationality Act, because that, that does come up quite often now. Yes, we received lots of queries where in the past, um, where the past um, clients could not or were told they were not allowed to apply for registration or for directly for British citizenship based on their ancestry. And um, Jason touched on where um, in some, some circumstances, women were not allowed to pass on the citizenship um, at certain point or where there was um, at some point in, in um, South Africa or in another country, um, um, visa point closed the, so there was no high commission or embassy and there was absolutely no way to register children or or even you know adults or or marriage um or becoming um british citizens based on marriage it was not possible to register these applicants can can now have their um situation reassessed and um have these applications um resubmitted or submitted new applications um, and this is just as read as um, from 2022. 
So we go through um, many um, queries applications um, and um, Jason knows and our advantage to have Snade and Morris on the other side is that the Home Office will require um, documents. Um, they will require birth certificates and marriage certificates going back to grandparents and to proof ancestry. So um, it is quite difficult to, to um, obviously <laughs> obtain documents um, like that um, in certain countries. Um, so um, it, it is not an easy task. Um, but um, Jason, we have been um, successful, haven't we, in in applying and obtaining um, marriage certificates, birth certificates, going um, into to um, archives in in Johannesburg in South Africa. So, and um, I think um, um, that's, that's all, all from the immigration, immigration and visa. visa. Wade, Wade, are you there? Are you receiving me? Am I able to ask you to pop in and give us some of your wisdom? Yes, I am here. Hi. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Platform's yours, mate. Okay. Um, yeah, how can I help you? Sorry, do you have a particular question? Uh, about... No, I, just, I, I wondered if there was anything which you wanted to reflect on and um, provide your particular um, views on. Yeah, yeah, sure. No, I just, well, first, I just want to thanks for, uh, say a special thanks for putting this uh webinar together it was really informative a lot of useful inf information for people um, I think you addressed some really key uh, questions um, you know around immigration and also um, what it takes to study overseas as well um, thank you so so big thanks for that and then from British Council I just want to uh, really acknowledge you know the importance of the partnership that we have with uh, Snaid and Morris um, they are our trusted you know legal attorneys um, here in South Africa so any inquiries that we get around uh, the like in this area, uh, we do obviously, you know, um, point them in the right direction. And then I think one of the I think towards the end of you know families uh, plans to immigrate, um, then it, we, there, there would obviously be you know the, the the necessary requirements to prove your English proficiency, and I think that's where. Uh, the British Council partnership comes in, so so we do support any candidates that you know um, uh, need any support for this. So um, yeah, so I think they're very well equipped now. So Nicole is a, a certified trainer trainer now. She is very familiar with uh, everything it takes to to reach the the, the band score that that candidates would need. Um, and if there's any other questions, yeah, please just reach out. Thanks very much. That's really useful. Thank you. Um, so that this final slide before we um, in, invite questions, which you're very welcome to type or to jump in and um, speak if you prefer, guys. Um, just a brief view of what we each do. Um, what's slightly intriguing is that CLC took the view that we talk about the sectors that we work for, um, and Snade and Morris took the view that they talk about the types of work they do. And I strongly suspect that there's a massive overlap here insofar as we most definitely do litigation for banking and lending clients and for healthcare clients and for charities. Um, and they undoubtedly do um, mergers and acquisitions within the company commercial sphere and so on and so forth. Um, so without a doubt, uh, there's tremendous overlap. Um, there's an awful lot which South Africa and uh, the UK have in common. Uh, and we at Scott and Cameron's have been delighted, just as um, Wade mentioned, that um, British Council have uh, to establish such a close friendship with trusted advisors in the form of Snade and Morris. Um, Jason, uh, or indeed Paul, is there anything you want to say to um, encourage people to trust you guys before we move on to Q&A? Thanks, Rufus. Yes, um, I think our, the, rela the relationship between our two firms is is going from strength to strength. And yes, um, as you can see there, we Snyder and Morris is a, a full spectrum law firm. Um, I think maybe there's a, two categories of law that we, we try to shy away from, but will assist you in being registering of patents and, and, and criminal law. But for the rest of it, we are a full service legal firm. Um, and yes, the jurisdictions are very similar both South Africa and UK being common law jurisdictions. We understand each other. 
Um, another facet of our, our our business that we we work very closely with Cartel and Cameron's on is a lot of our corporate clients who are wanting to now invest in the UK. Um, we are helping them through Cart with Cartel and Cameron set up their businesses in the UK, um, get their staff over there that they need to get over there. So, you know, we we've developed a strong footing in the country. Um, experience in all the, the the various courts and tribunals, so we look forward to being of assistance to you in in any of your your legal problems. And as we say, your legal right hand. Great. Um, we have a question which we didn't we, we've alluded to, but not actually tackled. Um, came from Rotendo. Um, I suspect this is a Nicole question, but I'm prepared to be overruled. Um, is doing Cambridge an advantage over the IEB for Matrix in South Africa? Do we have a view? Um, I think it depends on what level of Cambridge they've got and what they're looking to apply for, because Cambridge, although it's similar to IELTS, has different levels. Um, so you might have a level of Cambridge which is not equivalent enough to the IELTS UKVR for immigrating, and you'd have to still do the IELTS exam. So it depend what you're looking at and what level your Cambridge is. Thank you. Um, have we got any other questions? Um, the one which we tackled briefly uh, for Eddie Javier, I would like us to pick up on a one-to-one -one basis rather than so publicly, please. Uh, if anyone's got a general question, um, take yourself off mute and throw it at us, by all means. In that Rufus, case, uh, yeah. Mr. Jason, sorry, hello, Jason, it's Kieran here from HR user. I wonder if I just, can, not a question, but just say a couple of things, if that's okay. Two, please. Sure. Um, um, my name is Kieran Ryan, I'm the Assistant Director at HRUC and working with the international teams on student recruitment. And one of the things which we find is that the student recruitment sort of industry is very crowded with lots of agents offering 101 different things. And finding a good sort of partner or an agent is difficult. And one of the things which gives us confidence with Jason and his team is that they've actually visited us They've seen what we're like, so they know exactly where they're sending students or to what the place is like, which is, you know, unlike a lot of other agents or people who provide support for students, is that they've never visited, they don't know, they've only seen the, the glossy prospectus. So I think that's a real sort of advantage in kind of the trust that you can have in sort of Snade and Morris about in terms of working with them. The... Um, the other yeah. thing which I just wanted to add before, is that if you're coming here on any other visa, uh, so sort of ancestral visa, in fact, and you've got um, young people aged 16 to 18, then they will be entitled to home fee students rather than international at, at the colleges and schools. So you will not have to pay international fee for 16 to 18 year olds um, if, if, if their parents are here on an ancestral visa or a dependent visa, etc. Thank you. Thanks. Both Thank useful you. points. Can I just add as well to build on, um, sorry, it's Mark Bailey from Harrow Richmond Uxbridge College, working very closely with Ashin and Kieran. Just building on uh, Kieran's point around the trusted partnership and relationship with Snade and Morris, just to say that myself and Ashin had the pleasure of traveling to South Africa to further cement the relationship as well and carried out some very productive, proactive conversations to really drive this um, partnership forward. So we're, we're very proud to be working with Snade and Morris, but I just thought it was important to add that point in as well. But thank you. Great presentation. And thanks for allowing us to come along. Thank you for your contributions. They've been most useful. Yeah, if, um, if I can jump, jump in there, Rufus. Yeah, thank you, Kieran, Mark and Ashwin. Uh, and, 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 and as, as the, they said, Snade and Morris has an agreement with HRUC and we did indeed, Nicole and I, had the privilege of when we were on a family trip in December last year to actually visit the the um, Uxbridge College the campus. Um, and I must tell you, it is a fantastic campus. And and that is the that is your benefit of working with a firm like Snade Morris and Carter Lemon Cameron's. The difference, but with us and 
visa agents, immigration agents, student agencies. Snyder Morris is a regulated law firm. We we report to the Legal Practice Council here. Yeah, Carter Lemon Cameron's has to report to the Solicitors Regulatory Authority. So there is a quality assurance that you get from dealing with us in these these spheres. And uh, thank you to the guys from HOUC again for joining us. I, I appreciate it. Likewise, Seamus, you were going to make a contribution. Thanks, Rufus. Yeah, no, I, I've just had two points to make. I think the first is for Afshin. Um, with a with an obligation on the sponsor to ensure an eighty five percent rate for completing the course. I think I've got that stat right. Isn't there a, a massive incentive to ensure to put the blunt point to you? to ensure that uh, students on visas do not fail those courses and actually complete them. And then the, 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 the more facetious question probably for Wade is, ha has anybody making these applications ever used artificial intelligence to assist them in doing so? Um, yes, yeah, so Are on the- talking About the English assessment? Hmm. Okay, uh, not, not, for, not in our, um uh assessments uh Seamus so that, I think that's what differentiates us from the rest of the market um we have had some competitors that have run into a lot of trouble so we do know about this this issue so um there's other assessments such as Pearson where uh, they don't have a, a physical examiner um and they do use AI and software to you know examine the students and I think that's where people will figure out very quickly how to get around that so you know, with IELTS, it is a very secure test. It's it's the most secure test that you can get, and that's why it's the most recognized around the world. And you'll always be assessed with the physical examiner and the full examination uh, um, uh, uh, treatment. So th that's with the listening, reading, and writing. Um, and then obviously your um, uh, uh, speaking components, which takes place uh, after that. So no risk of that at all with your IELTS exam. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, hi, Seamus. I'll pick up on the other point. Um, so, at H well, any any institution are um, at HRUC, our um, qualifications they're all externally verified by um, by the awarding body. For us, it's mainly Pearson and some University of Arts London uh, qualifications. So, um, it wouldn't be just a case of a student just being able to we just pass them. They have to prove they've done the work uh, and somebody from the awarding body will come in and and check that work so it's it's uh it's there's a, there's a vigorous kind of pass um and an awarding process um and also regarding ai and use in applications um that that's why we tend to that's why we uh face-to-face -face interview students on zoom and video calls because um to try to uh navigate around that um potential problem uh so we we do want to see the student eye to eye to make sure that um uh, they're a credible applicant thank you guys Mike. there's a risk that we're going to break through an hour and a half which would be um unfair on those who um signed up for something slightly shorter and also make an absolutely massive file to try to upload to any website so I'm going to call it to a halt. I do want to thank very, very much all of our speakers, um, Nicole, Jason, Yamila, uh, and also the people who contributed uh, to what did turn out to be a healthily interactive session, whether contributing through the chat or by coming off mute and talking about your own experiences and um, about how things work in the real world. I think it was particularly useful to have um, HRUC being able to talk about real lived experience um, and similarly the British Council in South Africa. Um, so thank you very, very much. Um, I'm going to call it to a halt. Um, I would give you all a big round of applause, but it would sound weird on Zoom. So I shall simply say farewell and thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Take Thank care. You. Best of luck. Right. Thanks. Good night, Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.